Okay, thank you very much. We are now uh, in the second lecture of Inaso Reyes, which is talking about the quantum properties of relativistic stars. So, Ignacio, please, all yours. Okay, thank you, Christensen. Uh, and thanks to everyone for uh, tuning in. Um, okay, so I wanted to start with a recap uh, of what we talked about yesterday. Um, so the first thing that we talked about was this idea of the standard paradigm in the uh, theory of gravitational collapse. And that is a theory of fast gravitational collapse. Okay, and that's based on the early work of Oppenheimer and Snyder, the Penrose uh, theorem and so on. And it based, as we talked about yesterday, the picture looks basically like this. Now, what we discussed yesterday is that on the other extreme, if the contraction happens slowly enough, then the end point of this evolution is not, does not look like this, um, like the Oppenheimer-Snyder uh, diagram, but rather you hit the Buchthal limit before, forming a horizon, forming trap surfaces and so on. And in, in the Buchthal limit, we have uh, that the central redshift becomes infinite. And this is very similar to what happens. So what happens in the Buchthal limit at the origin is very similar to what's happening for a black hole for a black hole at the horizon, okay? namely that the redshift is going to infinity. And on the other hand, we saw that uh, this thing would develop uh, a naked singularity uh, at the origin. Um, the example that we saw in detail was the case, uh, second solution found by Schwarzschild in 1919, uh, uh, 19, I guess, um, was the constant density star. And finally, uh, we went through the derivation of Buchthal's theorem and we saw what were the assumptions. Essentially, the trick was to manipulate the Einstein equations without solving them, identify some total derivatives, uh, do some integrals and use some uh, the assumptions of the theorem. We rushed a little bit at the end, but I think the most important part of the message uh, got through. So the plan for today uh, is to move on to uh, examine now in, in, in more detail the theory of degenerate stars. And again, I know this is, so many of these things are very well known, but we're going to try to look at the less well-known aspects of it. So we're gonna start with uh, reviewing quantum statistical mechanics and looking essentially at the cold Fermi gas. Um, then we will look more in detail at the uh, oppenheimer Folkov paper. Uh, and finally, we're going to go through another example, which is very much related to that, which is due to Tolman. And there you can see a lot of, uh, you, can, you can write down everything analytically, and we're going to again look at the book, The Limit, and uh, discuss this issue of uh, conformality of matter at high densities. Okay, so very quickly, just uh, the history of the subject is, I find it really fascinating. Just going to flash out some some important uh, ideas. So in 1926, Fowler uh, speculated that white dwarfs uh, could exist, uh, supported by the degeneracy pressure of the electrons. Uh, of course, famously in 1929, Chandra Sekhar and other people uh, found the result for the electrons for the maximum mass uh, that was using Newtonian gravity. And then what I wanted to highlight here was the role of Landau, uh, which has been more or less lost to history. So the neutron was discovered in 1932, but Landau speculated in 1931, uh, where he said that when the density of matter becomes so great that atomic nuclei come in close contact, forming one gigantic nucleus. So he didn't propose exactly the idea of a neutron star, but he did imagine this idea of the, a star made of atomic nuclei. Um, in, after the discovery of the neutron, uh, Bade and, and Zwicky directly now proposed the idea of a neutron star and with an incredible insight, uh, speculated that this would be related uh, to supernova uh, formation. Um, anyways, in 1939, uh, we had these two famous papers by Oppenheimer and Folkov and by Tolman. And then in the 1960s, uh, people made tons of observations and that's, uh, history of pulsars and so on. Um, okay, so let's start with uh, quantum statistical mechanics. 
So in statistical mechanics, we use the density of states in phase space. Okay, that's uh, uh, given by this expression over here. Um, here, G has to do with this multiplicity, which just uh, depends on the spin. This is not going to be important, but it's included there. Uh, this is an, the this is measuring the density of states uh, in a cell of sort of size H uh, over here, and this is essentially given by some function f in phase space. Um, so once you have once we uh, choose a function, uh, some distribution in phase space, then we can compute things. For example, we can compute the energy density, which is given by this. So you're basically averaging the energy operator over the over phase space, right? Uh, similarly for the pressure, uh, you can do uh, this integral over here. This, is, this one is slightly different because you need to remember that pressure is sort of a momentum flux across the walls of the container. Uh, that's why you get the velocity here, which you can simply rewrite in terms of the momentum and the energy again. Uh, and you have a factor of one third, which has to do with the averaging of three dimensions. Um, notice that everything we're going to do for today is relativistic in the sense that the dispersion relation is relativistic. So we're going to look at relativistic quantum statistical mechanics. Um, okay, so the idea now is that uh, we consider simply an ideal gas in equilibrium. So we do uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, the distribution takes this form. This is, of course, very well known, where the plus and minus correspond to fermions and bosons, respectively. We're going to choose the plus uh, because we're, uh, we want to look at fermions. So then for the Fermi gas, we can go uh, to zero temperature. And then this distribution sort of flattens out, right? And we get uh, one, so the occupation number is one below the Fermi energy and is simply zero above the Fermi energy. Um, the Fermi energy is given in terms of the chemical potential at zero temperature. Um, so what you typically also do is define some related quantities, namely uh, the Fermi momentum is defined using the Fermi energy in the obvious way. Now, notice that uh, just as an observation, uh, here we're going to work at, at zero temperature. Of course, the generated stars are not at zero temperature. In fact, if you just take the simple case of the of Sirius B, which is maybe the best understood white dwarf that we know of, uh, which is, I hope you can see it here. I have a picture on the right. The, of course, the central figure is Sirius A, right? The one you can see in the night sky. But if you if you look here, I hope you can see uh, down here. There's a small companion that's Sirius B. Amazingly, this the existence of the companion star was predicted by Bessel in 1844, just by doing some very careful observations. This is the same Bessel from the Bessel function, by the way. And then people astronomers looked for it and found it uh, like 20 years later. I think this is absolutely amazing. But anyways, Sirius B has a temperature, a surface temperature of order 20,000 K. So obviously this is not zero temperature, but the point is that what you have to do is that you have to compare the temperature of the object with the Fermi energy, with mu essentially, the mu appearing here. And if you take that because the number of particles in a star is so large, the Fermi temperature is many orders of magnitude above this number. So effectively we can approximate this by a zero temperature computation. Uh, okay, so now uh, we can uh, go ahead and just do some computations uh, and see what we get. So let's start with the density. Uh, I'm just plugging back the formulas that uh, I showed you a second ago. So we integrate in phase space. In this case, we need to integrate the energy. That's what's uh, over here. And the rest is just the averaging factor. Um, now you can see here that this these are pretty simple integrals, right? Uh, essentially, this boils down to, if you take out the units, uh, this boils down to do this integral, square root of x squared plus one. If we factor, if we define this dimensionless quantity x, which is the ratio of the Fermi momentum over the mass of the particle. Okay, so this is this x over here is uh, uh, sort of measuring how relativistic the particles are because you're comparing the Fermi momentum, which uh, has the you know the relativistic factor there uh, over the mass. Um, 
So you can basically change variables from P, the momentum P to the variable X, do this integral, and you get some very simple integral. The result of that integral I'm calling chi of X. Okay, this is a very simple computation. And of course, we're integrating from zero to the Fermi momentum where uh, Fermi energy where the integral is cut. Actually, this should be the Fermi momentum, by the way. Um, when you do that simple integral, the function chi over here takes this form. Okay, it's rather simple. Um, and it gives some, uh, it's insightful to look at how this function behaves at low energy and high energy. So what does low energy means? Well, it, mean, well, it means that this ratio X uh, is small, whereas high energy means that this uh, number is very large. So the low energy case is actually non-trivial because imagine that we try to uh, compute the Taylor expansion of this uh, thing around x equals zero. So this part is rather easy, but then you also have the arc cinch. So you have to actually do the calculation. You What you figure out is that many terms cancel and the leading contribution goes as x to the power three. Okay, this is the standard computation. I don't, really, I don't wanna go through the details because this is the very well known part. Um, now, if you take the high energy limit, so this is when the Fermi momentum is much larger than the mass of the particle. So the particles become very relativistic. You can immediately see here, and this is very easy to see, is that uh, this thing, when X uh, goes to infinity, this goes to a constant, right? Because you're taking the arc of the hyperbolic sign. So th this, this one doesn't contribute. And here you basically have, on this term you have X, then you have another X, because x, x is becoming very large, right? So the square root of one plus x squared is essentially x. And then you have this two x squared. So you can see immediately that the dominant term here goes as two x to the power of four, right? Uh, and that's the first term that is written down here. You do the same thing for the next order and you find a plus x squared, right? That, that comes from the one over here. So this term comes from this one over here. This other term comes from this one. Well, very simple. We're just doing a high energy expansion. Um, okay, so that's the story for the density. Let's look at the pressure. Uh, very similar idea. Uh, we have to compute now a slightly different integral. You get a slightly different function. Uh, I just realized by the way that there's a typo here that I thought I had fixed. Let me fix it right away. Uh, Oops, this exponent over here should be a four instead of a two. Uh, that's kind of obvious because uh, rho has to have, it's a energy density. So it's energy divided by volume. So it has to have units of mass to power four. Uh, whereas chi is, a, is dimensionless. Uh, same thing here. Uh, this is a four. Okay, so for the pressure, you have a very similar thing. You get a different function, which I'm calling phi, and it takes a very similar form as before. Um, but here, uh, because you've got a different sign over here, if you do the low energy expansion, it, instead of getting x to the power three, you simply get x to the power five. Okay, again, this is very well known. And at high energies, uh, the only difference with the previous uh, result is that instead of getting uh, 2x to the power 4, you get 2x to the power 4 divided by 3, and then there's a minus sign here. Okay, but this is a very simple exercise. So what does this, uh, how do we use this in practice? What does this mean? So this gives us the equation of state at low energies and at high energy. So in the non-relativistic limit, we said when x was very small, uh, we get the standard non-relativistic equation of state, namely rho is proportional, uh, sorry, P is proportional to rho to the five thirds. And the reason is simply that if we go back, the pressure scales as X to the five, whereas the density scales as X to the three. Okay. So that means that uh, the pressure follows this rule. Uh, that's a fully non-relativistic, uh, result, that's what you would get from the Schrodinger equation. On the other hand, uh, and this is 
this is a slightly confusing uh, thing that you'll find in the literature. There's something that is confusingly called the ultra relativistic regime, which has this scaling, which I'm sure people have seen before. The statement that the, in the ultra relativistic case, uh, the pressure scales as rho to the power four over three. Now, I think this is misleading and very confusing because that's not what you would normally consider the ultra relativistic uh, approximation. So what it, how do you get the scaling over here? You need to do an approximation. So you get this thing by essentially um, in the pressure, you keep the high energy result, meaning that phi, so the pressure scales as x to the power four, but in the energy density, you keep the low energy approximation, okay? So then one of them scales as x to the four, the other one scales as x to the three. So you get a factor of four over three uh, relative. Now in many texts, particularly in the astrophysics text, this is what people call the ultra relativistic regime. I think this is confusing for the following reason, just that what I would think is the proper uh, ultra relativistic limit is when you don't do that approximation. And in both cases, you take the leading order terms when X becomes large. Now, when that happens, uh, it's easy to see the following. So what I mean is that here, we, uh, we would consider uh, this, uh, this regime for the pressure and for the density, we consider also this regime, okay, because X is becoming uh, very large. So you immediately see here that both terms scale with, if I uh, do this, both this term and this term scale as X to the power of four. So that, this means that the pressure and the density become proportional to each other. And the factor of proportionality of the leading term is one third, right, because this term over here has a one over three respect to this one. Now, if you um, if you do that, you'll see that at leading order, they, they become proportional. And you can look at the next to leading order, which in these expansions goes as x squared, okay? Now the x squared scales as basically the square root of this thing. So a very simple computation, will give you that um, at the very high energy regime. And what this means is that the density, the energy density is much larger than the energy density defined by the mass of the particle itself, which is the only parameter in the, in the theory. In this limit, rho and P become at leading order proportional with a factor of three. And then there's a sub leading term that depends on the mass of the, of the particle times the square root of the disk. So I'm emphasizing this point because what this means is that at leading order, this theory, these particles behave like a CFT, right? Because it's a conformal theory has rho, so T mu mu equal to zero, right? The trace of the energy momentum tensor, which in this case for a perfect fluid is is basically minus a rho plus three p. This thing should vanish. This thing vanishes for a conformal field theory. So what this result is telling us is that if you take uh, fermions at zero temperature and you look at the very high density or pressure limit, at leading order, the theory behaves like a conformal field theory, but of course there are subleading terms and those subleading terms are governed by the mass. If the mass was zero, this would be exactly a CFT. But at high energies, we approach the conformal, the, so the fixed point. Okay, so uh, a few comments uh, is that, again, uh, I find this sometimes uh, quite confusing, but you can effectively reduce the equation of state never doesn't take this form right off the bat from the computation. This is something you manipulated in order to write it like this. And at, so you can write it as P, proportional to rho to some uh, polytropic index gamma. And the point is that this gamma 
uh, go say from uh, five over three to one, this is the non-relativistic, uh, and this is the fully relativistic case. Okay. Um, and I'm mentioning this because this is going to be important, very important when we discuss quantum field theory. Um, well, sometimes you'll hear, or there's this sort of this idea that, uh, that relativity makes gravitational collapse easier in the sense that the more relativistic the particles become, the smaller the uh, polytropic index becomes. And that means that the sort of, yeah, it's, it's harder for the star to, the pressure scales more slowly with the density, so it's harder to remain in equilibrium. Um, now, just as a side comment, uh, we did a computation for, for fermions. What would happen if you take instead bosons? Uh, well, bosons at zero temperature condense, right? They go through Bose Einstein condensation. So the difference is that for the case of fermions, right, we have this situation where uh, we have the energy levels and they start sort of, you know, populating the, the spectrum like this and so the Fermi uh, level, right? Whereas in the case of the bosons, all of them are just going to go to the ground state, right? Ignacio? So this, yeah. Sorry, uh, Pedro Martinez asked in the chat the following question. Uh, can you think of a physical regime in which P is highly relativistic, but rho is not? In other words, what is the reasoning behind right. the standard ultra relativistic notation? I would, the answer is I would really like to understand this. I, I don't understand. Yeah. I know this is sort of standard in the literature, but, but okay. yeah, I don't really understand. So, also, Pablo Rodriguez has a question. Hi, Ignacio. So, uh, taking um, is more or less the same uh, question as, as Pedro, but taking into account the the usual or the uh, nowadays use of the non uh, ultra relativistic uh, uh, name. Did you know if uh, what happened with this uh, polytropic index in that case? Because you say that in the relativistic is one, non relativistic is more than one. Uh, sorry, so your question is about the polytropic index. You know, in, which case? in the case of uh, Carolian symmetries, uh, if there is a, a. In the usual nowadays, use of the uh, uh, name ultra relativistic, like it's linked with the Carolian symmetry. Oh, no, no, no. M maybe this is something you could. Uh, maybe you could explain this uh, later on in the discussion. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm not very familiar with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, um, okay. So now let's pass to the Oppenheimer and Falkov paper. So what is what what did they do in practice? So they took a very similar setting as we talked about yesterday. You just take a static spherical symmetric and isotropic perfect fluid stress tensor like this. You take a static metric like this, just as yesterday. And then you take uh, the equation of state uh, that we just talked about. Now, this is uh, the way, so the solution is numerical because, uh, so there is no analytic solution to this problem, uh, not known. Um, so how do you do this in practice? You basically, so you have a sphere, right? You impose some boundary condition here, namely the central density, so rho c. Okay, you just give it some value. And then you integrate numerically outwards until you find the point where you find the boundary, which is defined as the point where the pressure vanishes. Okay, so you just keep integrating until you, uh, you calculate the pressure at each step. And at some point you realize that the pressure vanishes, you declare that to be the boundary. Once you have RB, uh, you can calculate the mass finally by this expression that we showed yesterday, uh, calculating this. Because now you have, you integrate from zero to RB, you, you calculate it row, so you can numerically calculate the mass. So you basically, this will give you numerically a relation M as a function of central density, right? And that's going to describe a curve. 
And that curve became very famous. And this is the result. I'm going to go very quickly through this because this is very standard sort of textbook material. So the result looks like this. Uh, here we have the plot of the mass. And on the horizontal axis, we have um, basically the inverse tangent of the central, essentially the central density. Okay, they were using this weird notation with T0, but this is the central density. So the central density here is going to infinity. Okay, we're using the stand just like uh, Oscar was explaining uh, yesterday. So the curve has this property. Um, important uh, features. So first one is that the there's a maximum for the mass, okay? This is called the TOV limit. And for this, this plays the, a similar role as the Chandrasekhar limit, okay? The difference is the Chandrasekhar did a computation with Newtonian gravity and they did a computation with general relativity. But the essence is the same. So there is, for the Fermi Dirac equation of state at zero temperature, there's a maximum mass, there, there exists no solutions to the static equations above a mass given by this number, which if you replace the mass of the neutron, which is what they did, you get something of order one solar mass. And there are simply no solutions beyond that for the static problem. Um, that's quite amazing. Uh, the second important uh, feature of this, that again, I'm not going to review any detail here, I'm just going to tell you, is that if you now look at, so these are all exact static solutions of the Einstein equations. But then if you ask something about the stability of these objects, so if you perturb them, uh, for example, or look at their uh, uh, sort of thermodynamical stability, which is what, what they did, uh, but then people did many other kinds of stability analysis, you'll realize that the TOV limits so the maximum of this curve separates the system into two branches. The low density branch is stable and the high density branch is unstable. Okay. Um, so this picture is another argument for supporting the idea of fast gravitational collapse. Because the argument goes as, well, if you, um, these solutions over here, which are very uh, stars that have a very high density and high curvature in, in the interior, they are unstable. So the idea is that we'll, they will not be able to maintain equilibrium and they will collapse in form of black hole. No one knows exactly how, people never tell you, but somehow it's gonna happen. Um, now, there's another very interesting point, which is, uh, again, as I said, like part of the non-conventional uh, uh, aspects of the story, which is this point over here is the last solution to this point where the central density goes to infinity. And I hope that after what we talked about yesterday, you will anticipate that this solution over here is related to the Buchthal singularity as we talked uh, yesterday, because this is the last smooth solution. It's the, the last, you could say the last solution with bounded uh, pressure or density, right? Um, of course, they did not phrase it in this way because this was in 1939, Buchdahl's paper was published 20 years later. Uh, but they realized the importance of this, uh, of this solution and they analyzed it in some detail. Um, so, okay, so basically this, the Oppenheimer and Focke paper contains a lot of insightful ideas. There are two that survive sort of in the mainstream uh, story, which is the existence of a maximum mass and then that the solutions beyond that maximum are classically unstable. Now, the things that I think that are very interesting but did not make it to this uh, mainstream story for good, for understandable reasons, is that the end point of this curve is uh, you, you hit the Buchthal uh, singularity and the fact that they discussed uh, in detail that at high energies, the equation of state for the fermions becomes conformal at least. They didn't use this phrasing, but the, the, this is exactly what we were talking about before. Um, so they really use the, what I would call the fully relativistic equation of state and not this 
intermediate uh, approximation uh, that is sometimes called this uh, ultra relativistic limit. So, okay, so one thing that you can see, and, and it's really beautiful, uh, and I haven't seen this done anywhere, but, but, but I'm sure it must be somewhere, but it's very, very simple, is that we can now start zooming in into that last solution and understand what's its relation to the Buchwald theorem. So one thing we can do very easily is to compute the redshift, the central redshift. So remember when uh, yesterday we were talking about the Einstein equations, uh, we said there's a continuity equation, right? Uh, like this, and it takes this particular form. Okay, this is just due to the symmetries. Um, so in principle, solving this equation in general is hard, but in this case, there's a magic simplification that happens, which is that, uh, so before we define these two functions, chi and phi, uh, that came from these momentum integrals in phase space. And you can just notice that there are some simplifications. In particular, if you add them, which is what you have to do here in the numerator, the arc cinch disappear and some other terms disappear and you get something very simple like this. On the other hand, the derivative of the pressure, which is proportional to the derivative of the function phi, also simplifies very much. All these hyperbolic signs and so on, all these things go away and you get a simple function. So much that when you now take this, the quotient, which is what you have to do here, in terms of the variable x now, it simply becomes this thing over here. It's a completely trivial function. Um, meaning that now we can integrate this equation. The left-hand side of the integral simply gives us the log. So we integrate from, let's say, one radius to radius r1 to a radius r2. Those two radii are, uh, let's say, r1 and r2. They have their, their associated uh, values for, the, for this um, variable x. Remember, this was the Fermi momentum divided by m. So here, the particles are going to be more relativistic. Outside in the surface, they're going to be re less relativistic. That's controlled by the radius. So you can perform this integral. It's completely trivial. This is uh, done here on the right-hand side. Um, and uh, if you just replace and notice that at the surface, uh, so this equation holds for any two sort of radial locations on the, on the sphere. And now we can take those two locations as x1 related to the center, R1, and X2, we take it at the boundary. Uh, yeah. If you do that in this equation, this means that um, in the Buchthal limit, X1, uh, which is at the center, becomes very large. X2, which is at the boundary, the particles are not relativistic there. X2 is very small. And if you just plug this into here, this is the equation that you get. Okay, this is literally the, uh, the equation we had uh, before. So this thing relates, notice what this is doing. This thing relates the ratio of, or in other words, the redshift compared at the center and at the surface is given by the, uh, the ratio between the mass of the particle and the central density. So this, uh, the interpretation, this has a very simple interpretation, namely that if the density at the center goes to infinity, then the redshift, so the last function at the center goes to zero. And this is exactly the definition almost of the Buchthal limit, right? But now you can really see it in action. The integrals are trivial. You can just work out the example. That's very nice. Um, okay, so as I said before, the Oppenheimer and Volkov solution is numerical, so it's uh, so it's convenient. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do now. We're going to look at a very closely related solution, uh, which is worked out by Tolman on a paper that was published the, the same month, I think, uh, from the other one. That is very similar to the Oppenheimer uh, Volkov solution, but that is fully analytic, so we can understand everything very easily. So. As I said, there was this paper uh, by Tolman in 1939. Uh, it's a very beautiful paper where he gives a classification of some very interesting exact solutions. Uh, the one we're going to focus on is what he called the type four solutions. 
So these are not identical to the Oppenheimer's uh, Falkov problem, but they are very closely related and they are simple. So this is what the solution looks like. It contains two parameters. One is the mass, which for us is going to be fixed. And the other one is a parameter that I'm calling Z uh, that goes between zero and one. Okay, and for each value of Z, we get a different solution. Now, you can work out, uh, he gives uh, explicitly the two functions in the metric, H and F. It doesn't matter really for us what H is, that's why I put it like uh, uh, semi-transparent. What will matter for us is what F is. So notice what happens in the two, in these two regimes. What happens when f? Uh, sorry, when the parameter z goes to one, then f becomes one, right? Now again, it's not it's not obvious to see this, but if you put uh, z equals to one in the first line, you see that this term drops out, this one drops out, this one drops out, everything cancels, and you also get h. Uh, sorry, h is equal to one. But those were the two only functions in the metric, right? Which means that this has to be flat space. Okay, so the limiting, the limit when z goes to one is simply flat space. Now, when z goes to zero is the more interesting case. Uh, when z goes to zero, notice that if we evaluate the lapse function at the origin, the second term, so this one always cancels at the origin because there's an r squared there. But now when z is equal to zero, the first term also cancels. So this thing goes to zero at the origin and is otherwise positive because both terms are positive. Therefore, this thing is the Buchta limit for this particular system. So now I just told you what the metric functions were. Of course, this comes with an accompanying equation of state to solve the Einstein equations. Again, what the precise equation of state is, is not gonna be important. So I left it in uh, so transparent. The thing that will be uh, important are the central values of the density and the pressure. And as you can see here, and probably, um, I mean, you can see immediately that the, the same thing as before, if we take Z to one, the central density goes to zero uh, and the central pressure also goes to zero again, because this is flat space, okay? There's no source for the Einstein equations, no matter. On the other hand, if z goes to zero, and this is more interesting, both of them diverge, right? Because there's this uh, factor of z in the denominator. Again, this is what we would expect exactly in the book that limit. Now, if you take the difference, the, the trace of the energy moment intensity, so rho minus 3p at the center, some terms cancel over here. You simply uh, do that little computation and you get this. So you see this thing when Z uh, goes to zero, which is the Bufa limit, this thing goes to a constant. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. This thing just goes to a constant. So again, you see that this equation of state is not, while it is not identical, to the equation of state for fermions, because for fermions, uh, we saw that this thing should scale as m squared times the square root of rho, whereas this, so, which is not a constant, as a function of density, this one goes to a constant. But the, the important thing here is that at leading order again, it becomes conformal because these two terms become proportional. So rho is diverging, p is diverging, they become proportional with a factor of one third as radiation, right? That's the conformal case. And then there's some rest that depends on some other numbers. In this particular case, it's some constant that depends on the mass of the star. But qualitatively, it has the same feature of uh, approaching at, so at leading order the conformal fixed point. So now finally, we can calculate the curvature invariance uh, that tell us something about the geometry. So consider, for example, the Ricci scalar. Um, the Ricci scalar, uh, this is also a very simple calculation. If you just take 
um, the Einstein equations and you take the trace, uh, so you, multi right, you multiply by g mu nu. On the left hand side in four dimensions, you get minus r. And on the right hand side, you get the trace of the energy momentum tensor, right? So the Ricci scalar is given by um, minus the trace, which is essentially rho minus 3p with those uh, prefactors. Um, so, but, but this is going to tell us something very interesting because the Ricci scalar, if we just replace, if we evaluate at the center and replace the previous expressions, a very simple computation, you find that it simply goes like this. Now, in the books at limit, notice the Ricci scalar, when we take now z going to one, you might have thought that this would diverge. It, in fact, it could diverge. But when z goes to one, which is the Buchthal limit, this simply goes to, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, z goes to zero in the Buchthal limit. This thing just goes to a constant, okay? Now, what, what happens if you look at other curvature invariants? So take, for instance, the Euler class, which is defined uh, like this in four dimensions. You have the Riemann tensor squared, the Ricci uh, tensor squared, and the Ricci scalar. We just do that computation. It's very easy. Just plug in the previous expressions. You find this result. And you notice what the crucial difference with the behavior of the Ricci scalar is. Namely, that this thing diverges when z goes to zero. This thing diverges as one over z squared, right? So this is a particular example of a more general feature that happens in, so to speak, classical matter in the Buchthal limit. Namely, that the Ricci scalar is suppressed with respect to the other curvature invariants. Ricci scalar is scaling slower than it's, in a certain way, the natural scaling that it would have, because naturally it would be proportional to rho, to the density and the and the pressure. There's Ignacio? a question. Yeah. Yes, uh, Juan has a question, please, Juan. Hi, Ignacio. Uh, uh, when z uh, tend to zero in the previous slide, it's, it's mean flat. Uh, oh, did I mess them up? Maybe in the previous really? one. Here, yeah. When z is zero, uh... no, it's fine. So it's, it's fine, z right? Yeah, flat. yeah. I, I also thought I was confusing one. It's, it's fine, right? Z is it's flat when z is one. Okay, thank you. Okay, cool. Fine. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so that's the observation. The Ricci scalar is suppressed with respect to the other curvature invariants. Uh, because matter is approaching this conformal fixed point. Um, so finally, and going back to uh, some of the questions that appeared yesterday, that's why I decided to give this particular example today, is uh, that the Tolman solution four gives an example of this exact adiabatic contraction at the linearized level that we were talking about before. Because the solution had two two parameters, right? One was the mass, and the other one was this uh, factor z, this coefficient z. So the idea of the adiabatic contraction is that an object is contracting, but if we consider the simplest case, namely uh, the case where the star is completely opaque, so it's not radiating, those are perturbations on top of whatever uh, we look at, but suppose it's not radiating, um, that means that the asymptotic mass, which you define, say, at infinity, uh, or at the boundary of the star, m has to be constant, through, right, along the collapse. OK? Um, so in the nice thing about this solution is that we can just fix the mass m, and then the contraction, for, so basically, uh, in the case of, if you go back to the case of the uh, Oppenheimer Folkhoff paper, the curve, the way how they parameterize the solution, the curve looks something like this. So that the, in the Buchthal limit, um, you're approaching this solution, which has some particular mass that you can calculate. Uh, but notice that what they did was to do sort of a conformal 
sort of a compactification of the of the of, of this axis where you had the inverse tangent of the central density, right? So, uh, but if but if you were to open this thing up and and essentially um, plot the mass as a function of density itself, you will see that this flat th this curve just flattens at infinity, right? Because it's just conversion to a constant, right? So, in in our particular case. Uh, the solution would lo look simply like this. So we would have the total mass of the solution is fixed and uh, the density is just increasing without bound. And what is changing now is that Z is becoming smaller. So Z uh, would go to zero in this limit. But apart from that, so this is an exact solution to the linearized equations. And this is related to the Pedro's question yesterday, I think. This provides one example of a solution that is exact, that has a constant mass, and that satisfies the linearized equations for this adiabatic construction. And the thing that is sort of governing or the parameter moving you from one solution to the other, you could think of this parameter Z, which is going to zero in the book that land. Um, so finally, uh, one comment now uh, about the the null rays. Uh, I, I think I have like two more minutes, no? You have uh, nine, nine minutes. Oh, I have nine minutes, okay. So, um, yeah, so the last uh, thing is that we had talked about in the case of the constant density star, we analyzed the, oh, there's a question. Oscar. Yes, yes, in uh, yes. How, how can you understand, uh, because when you have zero density, you have mass, right? In the, in the, in the graph that, in, in the plots that you... Show. Are we talking about this one? Yes, yes, the first graphic. Uh, uh -huh. Because you have something that has the zero density, but has a mass, right? Oh, no, no, sorry, sorry. So, so this object, so density here is increasing to the right. It's just that this parameter Z is decreasing to the right. So remember that the density, uh, sorry, the central density of this thing was diverging with Z. So actually, if you move to the right on this plot, the density is going to infinity. Exactly, but, but in the other direction, because I guess that the, the, the plot at the right. Oh, you're talking about this, about yes, this exactly. region. Yes. Uh, oh, that's a, well, that's a very good question. Okay. I think this is the answer. Okay. That's a very good question. And I think the answer is, can I answer that with the next line actually, because it's kind of connected. Okay. okay, okay. Uh, so you can calculate. Okay. Very nice. You can calculate, uh, Analytically, of course, uh, you know where the radius of the sphere is, okay? This is the surface of the star and, and the mass is just apparent. So you can calculate this ratio analytically. And if you do a computation, you simply get this thing over here. Now, we said that, okay, but so let me, uh, so Z is going to infinity, uh, sorry, Z is going to zero in this direction. And here Z is going to one, uh, sorry, you're going to one. Maybe I can write it, sorry, I'll write it like this. In this lift. That we said is flat space, right? But now your question, how can this be flat space, right? Um, so notice what happens for this expression, uh, which is measuring the compactness. Uh, that's the ratio of the radius over the mass. When you take Z going to one, this thing R over, over m goes to infinity. That means that the mass is fixed because that's a fixed number, right? Let's say one solar mass or whatever. But the radius of the sphere is growing without bound, which means that the fluid is becoming infinitely diluted, right? Because the star is becoming infinite in size. So that means that the so the mean density in the universe is, is going to zero, but in such a way that the total ADM mass is conserved, right? So it's not. Yeah, it's kind of a weird uh, flat space limit, but where the, there's still a conserved charge there. Maybe it's not actually exactly flat space. Um, 
On the other hand, notice what happens when we take z going to zero. So this is the Buchthal limit. In that case, r over m goes simply to three. Now, if you um, remember, sorry, if you remember what we talked about yesterday, when we're in the discussion of the null geodesics and the light rings, I told you that because the exterior solution always has, is always the Schwarzschild solution, the Schwarzschild vacuum solution, right? We're, yesterday we saw that as an object becomes more and more compact, light rings can appear. So these photon spheres were light controlling surface. But we, we said that the first time they appear was precisely when r over m is equal to three, right? Because that's where the first light ring of the ex exterior solution appears. But notice the very interesting uh, coincidence that for this equation of state, even in the Buchthal limit, so in, in the most compact version of the star, the light ring marginally appears. In other words, you have this contraction of the star towards its Buchthal limit, and there are no light rings ever, uh, right? Until in the very Buchthal limit, which which is sort of a similar a singular limit, there would appear uh, a light ring here, but right at the surface of the star. So it's a very it's a very particular um, thing happening there. I don't honestly understand exactly why this happens. Um, so what does this mean in terms of the uh, potentials of the null geodesic equation? that we were uh, looking at yesterday, simply that if you take a value of z that is say close to one, right? Something far away from zero, the potential looks simply like this. It has no local minimum and it's not developing a minimum or a salt in any. Whereas in the Buchthal limit, when z goes to zero, you see there's, you're gluing the interior solution to the exterior solution and this thing develops um, sort of marginally develops a light ring at 3m. So this would be 3m, but right at the Buchthal limit. So what I wanted to illustrate with this example is that, first of all, the Buchthal limit does not imply the existence of light rings. This, they can or might or not uh, be there, depending on the situation. And the other thing I wanted to emphasize is the difference between what is normally called the Buchthal limit in the literature and what I like, and what it, something that you might call the generalized book limit, which is this idea. Normally, if you just open the literature and you ask for the book, you know, and you ask what does the book limit mean, you're going to see this expression r over m has to be larger than 9 over 4. And that's, as we saw yesterday, the result of Buchthal's theorem. But with the theorem, the theorem is not telling you that if you take any equation of state, the last smooth solution has this compactness. I just gave you an example where this ratio goes to three, which is much larger than nine over four, right? So if you pick an equation of state and you look at the last smooth solution, what we've been calling the book of the limit so far, what the theorem tells you is that whatever under the under the assumption, if the assumptions of the theorem are valid, then this ratio over here is going to go to some number that is determined by the equation of state, but it will always be sorry larger than nine over four. That's what the theorem tells you. It doesn't tell you that it has to go to nine over four. Um, but this this version of the th of the Buchthal limit gives you only one part of the story. What I think is the most physical and important part of the theorem is what I think of what you could call the generalized uh, both a limit, which is not the limit where, where this bound is saturated. I'm not talking about that. What I call the generalized both a limit is when the lapse function of the origin goes to zero, because that's the thing that controls the curvatures and so on. Um, so um, take a message for today. Um, so we looked at the POV theory of degenerate stars, and we saw that it uses relativistic quantum mechanics. 
Okay. And uh, that entered to the analysis of you know the density and phase space. And we used the Planck's constant, but you used it in the context of quantum mechanics. Um, in that context, we saw that at very high uh, Fermi momentum in this example, the if you take the equation of state and you calculate the trace of the energy momentum tensor, you'll see that a leading order, it vanishes. That means you're approaching this conformal point and the subleading terms are controlled by some other pattern use. That example is the mass of the fermion. Now, the things that are very well known of the oppenheimer focal theory is that it leads to a max, so to a, there's a maximum value of the mass for static solutions and that on either side of the solution, you get either a stable branch for low densities and un an unstable branch for high densities. Normally people in astrophysics just throw away the unstable branch. So it's unstable classically. Um, and we also saw a particular example uh, taking this Tolman four uh, type metric that resembles very closely the Oppenheimer photo system. Um, we understood that the endpoint of this evolution is the Buchta limit or the generalized Buchta limit. And we saw this important property, that the Ricci scalar is suppressed with respect to the outer curvature invariance. Again, for the reason uh, above. So in the final lecture, what I want to go through is the question of, uh, this is all fine, but we used, still use quantum mechanics. So the question is going to be, is there a property of quantum field theory in curved space-time that is not contained in the quantum mechanical description that can tell us something about the dynamics of this problem? And of course, the answer will be yes, and we're going to talk about that tomorrow. That's it. Thank you.